Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our stream of our Wednesday night service. I'm so delighted that you've joined us tonight for our time of study in God's Word. Uh, if it is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, normally, we have our live stream service uh, in, in our building, in our facility, uh, but we have been out of our facility now for, I think it's been about two months. Uh, we had a nice storm back in February, and there was a big leak, and there's been a lot of uh, repair work that's been going on since, and we certainly praise the Lord for all the work that has been done. Uh, we were able to meet with uh, uh, our contractors yesterday, and uh, when we spoke with them, it sounds like we're still on pace to being able to be back in the building at this point. It, won't, it definitely won't be this weekend, uh, but possibly by the following weekend, and it seems like certainly by the second weekend of May. I think it's I think it seems, uh, or they've made it seem as though it's likely we'll be back in the first week of May, uh, but uh, it seems like it'll be a, a definite go by the second week of May, if not uh, before then. And so at this point, uh, all the, as, as far as I know, I think all the major orders are placed. I think that they had mentioned that the carpet's already arrived in Austin. They just haven't installed it yet different things like that and so things are moving along uh, if you were have been there if you were there this past sunday and you had a chance to go in the church building uh, you saw some of the doors have been stained and things like that so just additional uh, things are uh, coming together you know which we're excited about and it's fun to see things coming back together and we're certainly really looking forward to all being back together in the building itself and so anyway all that being said if it's your first time joining us normally we stream from uh, our building, but uh, not able to do so today, and so, but we're, we're thankful for the technology and, you know, just being able to make use of the means that the Lord has provided to us, and so, uh, but thankful you're here, uh, so grateful again that we get to study God's Word today. I feel like the past number of times we've been considering different um, topics pertaining to God's sovereignty, so we looked at God's sovereignty uh, in election, we've considered God's sovereignty in sanctification. We've considered God's sovereignty in evangelism. And we're just going to continue uh, in line with that on that same track this evening. And we're going to be considering uh, God's sovereignty in prayer. And so uh, that, that's where we'll be headed. And as we head there, uh, go ahead and invite you to pray with me. Just to ask the Lord's blessing on our time and that this would be an impactful study. We know that the Lord's Word doesn't return void, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, and I trust that it won't this evening. It's not going to start now, and so I just pray that we'd be, we, we, we would gain the full uh, benefit from our time of study, uh, that uh, we'd be able to. That's certainly what I want, and that's what I want for you, and so let's pray to that end with one another. Father, what a blessing it is that we can come before you yet again. Lord, you are the one that has given us breath in our lungs that we could come before you. You've given us the desire in our hearts that we would know you more, that you, we would see you more clearly through your word. And Father, we come to you this evening praying to that end, uh, that we would grow in our understanding of prayer, that we would grow in our understanding of you, and that uh, in turn, the way that we live out uh, your word, the way that we uh, live out uh, our prayer life would be something that further reflects uh, what we see to be true in your word and that you'd receive more glory through that. Father, we're so grateful for who you are and for the things that you're doing in our lives, and we pray that we would uh, grow in our love for you this evening. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a concern that I've heard voiced by many, uh, it goes something like this. If God is sovereign, if God has predetermined the things that are going to come to pass, then do my prayers really have a purpose? Like, if God has already appointed the ends that will come about, then what role do my prayers actually play? Do my prayers mean anything at all. If God already knows what he's going to do, which, you know, if, if, and we're told to pray in the Bible, then, you know, yeah, where's the rub? How does, how does that work out? If we're told to pray, 
God knows what's going to happen. Why should we pray? What is the purpose of our prayer? Why pray if God is sovereign? I guess if you're going to boil down or funnel down the question, that's what we get to. And that's a question that you've almost certainly considered before. It might even be a question that is, is, has been uh, on your mind as of late, something that you've been processing through. Do my prayers matter because God is sovereign? And it's a valid question to ask. It's a valid question because, yes, we're told in the Bible to pray. We have a desire to uh, know that when we come before the Lord, not only that our prayers are heard, but that our prayers would be answered based on what we see to be true within the Scriptures. And linked at the hip with this, this concept of the, the purpose of our prayers, why we're praying to begin with, is the motivation of them. Since God is sovereign, what is our motivation to pray if the uh, ends have already been determined? Questions you may have asked, things you may have thought through. If you haven't been thinking about these things lately, you certainly are now. But if you were to just pause for a moment, Pause for a moment, you know, I've listed a bunch of different questions, but where I want us to begin is just by thinking about the overwhelming grace that we have in being able to pray at all. Like we just prayed with one another. Uh, you might be praying now, even in considering the topic of prayer, but it is an absolutely staggering reality that at any point in the day, at any moment in the night, we can come before the Lord, the one who's fashioned the heavens and the earth, like the one who has appointed the stars in their places, the one who appointed us where we are in the Milky Way galaxy, the one who has set the planets where they are, Neptune and Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and Venus, the moon that you look up at night, the one that has crafted the Grand Canyon, the one that has placed the redwood forest where it is, the one who has designed the Great Barrier Reef. You can speak with him whenever you like. Like that is an, a, a really incredible thought. Like that's, that's much more incredible than having you know, the, the president's phone number in your phone or any world leader for that matter. You have the one who is all-powerful that you can communicate with and commune with at any point. And we take this a step further, though, because it's not it's just as though you can talk with someone that's all-powerful. You can in God. But... God is someone that loves you. Like, it's not just as though you have access to some world leader. You have access to the leader of the world, the one who is over all. And you can speak with the one that cares for you more than anyone else does in this earth. More than anyone else does. God cares about you more than your wife does if you're married. More than your husband does if you're married. God cares about you more than your kids do. God cares about you more than your parents do. God cares about you more than absolutely anyone on this earth, and he, he proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt when he sent his only begotten son to a cross to die for your sins in your place, though he had none and you didn't deserve it. God loves you more than anyone else does, and so God cares for us, and God invites us into a relationship with him in salvation, and he invites us into prayer where we commune with him. And so we want to know, those that are laboring in prayer, that our prayers actually matter. That our prayers mean something. After all, he cares for us, according to 1 Peter 5, 7. So our prayers should mean something. Right. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Luke 22. That's where we're going to be in our time of study. This evening we're going to be considering two verses in our time together. Luke 22, verses 41 in 42. And in our text, we'll see both the purpose of prayer as well as the motivation of prayer being modeled for us. And what this should do, this text should provide for you a healthy dose of comfort and being reminded that your prayers uh, not only just have a general theoretical purpose, but they matter. Like your prayers matter to God. Your prayers mean something. Your prayer is valuable. God thinks so. And that's what we're going to consider in our time together this evening. And the way we're going to see this play out, the way we'll see this take place is in a unique prayer in Scripture where we see God, the Son, the person of Christ, speaking to God in the person of the Father. So in, in other words, what we have here truly is a perfect prayer request. 
I want to go ahead and read our text this evening. If you haven't turned there, you can turn there now. I'll, I will read the verses for you so you'll have them. Luke 22, verses 41 and 42. And he, referring to Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. There is so much that we can learn from this text, and there's so much that we won't get to this evening that I'd like to, because this is just such a, uh, such a dense text with so much truth about who our God is. But in it, what we're going to focus on, what we'll see is we'll see how we pray, why we pray, and what prayer does, or what prayer does. Uh, effectively the purpose of prayer. And as we consider the nature of prayer, as I mentioned, we're considering God's sovereignty in prayer this evening. Uh, when we're considering prayer alongside God's sovereignty, I think we need to be reminded of who our God is. I think we need to be reminded and consider some texts about our God being sovereign, that God is in control. That's just another way of saying sovereignty. God controls things that come to pass. We'll see that. Let's consider some verses. Psalm 115.3, it's one that I mention very often because it's such an important verse. We read, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So whatever God pleases, he does, just flipping that around. Job 2.2 2 says, I know that you can do all things, referring to God, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That back part's equally important. Nothing that God has determined to take place will stop or be halted, or be thwarted. It will never happen. Proverbs 19.21 declares, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Not just the imaginings or wishful thinkings of men, but what God has determined. Psalm 135.6, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. In Isaiah 46.10, Isaiah writes that God is the one declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all, all my purpose. God's in control. There's nothing that God doesn't know. God's all-powerful. We see those things in the verses, in the context of the verses that I just mentioned. So how does this knowledge of our comprehensive God affect our prayer? How, what happens in light of knowing that God is sovereign? Well, we can sort of break down and really analyze as though we have a microscope through the Word. We can look at um, it just sort of the knowledge of the Lord on display, the comprehensive knowledge of the Lord on display when it comes to our very prayers. Consider what David says in Psalm 139, 4. He says, Even before there is a word on my tongue, Behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. <laughs> wow, right? Before you open your mouth to pray, God knows what God knows what's going to come out. Absolutely everything. And that is a that is a really overwhelming thought. That is an amazing thought to consider. God knows what we will say before we ask. And so God already knows what we need before we pray. Yes, he does. Consider Matthew 6, 8. Jesus says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. <laughs> it's not just before the words on your tongue, but before maybe even you recognize the need that you have. God already knows that you have it. Like absolutely everything. That is a, that is a, um, a, a very uh, lasting, comprehensive knowledge that he has. He knows everything. You know, 1 John 3, 20, or... Uh, First uh, uh, John 3, God knows all things. I can't remember if it's 3.20 or 3.2. Um, but God knows, he knows everything. But because God knows everything, does that mean that your prayers all of a sudden don't matter? No, of course not. It just means that God knows everything. It doesn't mean that your prayers don't have a purpose. Um, it, it just shows that God knows what we need and that God cares to us. Because, you know, throughout the Bible, it's you know equally true that God desires for us to pray. Like over and over and over again in Scripture, we see that God invites us into this, uh, this process whereby we communicate 
with him. And this shows that he cares for us too. In Philippians 4, 6, Paul writes, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We're invited into that. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul commands the Thessalonian believers, stems down to us today, to pray without ceasing. We're to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, according to Ephesians 6.18. Paul says in Colossians 4.2 that we're to continue steadfastly in prayer. And just one more on the list for now, but in 1 John 5.14-15 through 15 we read, And this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So God is in control. We've seen that already in our time of study. We're told to pray. We just read verses about that. And according to what John, what John says, God hears the God answers prayer requests. He hears and answers them. So I think at this point we can see, at least at a fundamental and basic level, that our prayers do matter even it just in that God calls us into praying to him. So prayers do matter. Prayers have a purpose, and God is sovereign. And so how does this happen? God is sovereign. Our prayers matter. First, it might seem like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. But again, so God, he knows what we need before we ask. He knows what we'll ask before we do. If, if, if God is sovereign and only his determined will comes to pass, and we're commanded, as we saw in 1 John 5, 14 through 15, to pray in line with God's will or to pray according to the things that please him in Scripture, then I think we have a view into the process. Like, I think we have it. I just think we have to sort of push these realities together and analyze them side by side. Your prayers are the means of God's appointed ends. Your prayers are the way in which God's plans and purposes come to pass. And boy, if that, if that thought doesn't bring you low, I don't know what will. I hope you can see that your prayers absolutely matter. Absolutely matter. They're very significant. God's will is accomplished through the prayers of his people. How cool is that? <laughs> Our prayers are the train track on which the train of God's will runs and... <laughs> There's no stopping that train. You can't stop the train. At which point, though, some of you might be a little bit concerned. Some of you might be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit cautious with this thought and a little bit reserved, and you might be thinking, well, if, if, if our prayer is a way by which God's will is accomplished, how do we know that all the prayers that are needed are going to be asked? Well, that's, a, that's you. You know, we, we find our answer in Scripture. God is the one that will. That God is the one that makes sure that all the requests, uh, that he, that uh, all the, um, you know, the prayers uh, that he desire would be asked. I mean, we read in Philippians two thirteen, Paul writes, "For it's God who's at work in you," it's referencing sanctification, but equally true in prayer, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. God ensures that the prayers of His people will ascend to Him, guaranteed. So, should we pray? If God is sovereign, should we do that? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We should pray because God is sovereign. If God is sovereign, which he is, our prayers are the means by which God's will is accomplished. And our prayers are very are knit to, to his will being done on the earth. But just think about this, though. Even if when we prayed, nothing was accomplished. Like, that's not true, but even if that were the case, that nothing was accomplished through prayer, we should still pray because God asks us to, out of a love for Him. I think oftentimes when we think of worship, we only think of singing, but that's not the case. Like, when we pray, we are worshipers. Think about what prayer shows. It shows our dependence upon God. We come before God, and we exclaim who He is, you know, we worship him through testifying of who he is. We worship him even through making requests of him, showing our dependence on him. But even if none of our prayers were to be answered hypothetically, we should still pray to God because he asks us to and he receives glory through it. But of course, we know God delights in answering prayer. Like God loves doing that. That's God's heart toward you that prayers would be answered. And it's an opportunity for us to worship him. So it's a win-win. 
Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. John says in 1 John 3, 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So we want to do what God delights in because we love him. We want to honor him. And it's a wonderful blessing that our prayers accomplish uh, his purposes in this divine orchestration of the world that he's established. And so God answers prayers, and we should pray. Both are true. And so then the question comes up, so does God answer all of our prayers? Yeah, he does. I know at some point some of you might be a little bit on your toes with that, but God does answer all of our prayers, and here are the answers. They are yes, not now, or no. But they're all answered. They're all answered in one way or another by the Lord. And the prayers that are answered in the affirmative, they're in accordance with His will. The prayers that are answered not now are in accordance with His will, but the timing is not right. And the prayers that are answered no aren't in accordance with His will. Consider James 4.3. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So that's a prayer that God's not going to answer. A prayer for a new Ferrari is a whole lot different than a prayer that the unreached peoples of the world would hear the gospel. It's a whole lot different than a prayer for a brother and sister in Christ that's suffering from cancer. It's a whole lot different than that our daily provision would be met by the Lord. So uh, that, that would be one example of a no, but I think we see another example of a no in Scripture that's different from James 4.3, and that's what we'll see in our text tonight. You've almost certainly heard the expression, the shot heard round the world. It's an expression that's attributed to the American Revolution, the beginning of it, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And uh, tonight, what I think we see is the no heard round the world, or at least a prayer that isn't fully answered in the affirmative. And it's undoubtedly a difficult text for us to work through in Luke 22, verses 41 through 42. But I think it's invaluable for us in that we still do see within this text the motivation for our prayer and the purpose for our prayer, and in that it's modeled directly by God himself. And both of these realities stem from God being sovereign. So I, let's go ahead and read our verses again. Let's go ahead and read them again, just so we're really saturated with them, and then we'll begin to transition uh, slowly, but we will get into our text. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. This conversation is taking place after the Last Supper. Jesus went out to the Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives, a place where he frequented with his disciples during his ministry, and he, Jesus takes them there to pray. He's going to go and pray. He commissioned, uh, some, of the, he commissioned some of them to pray as well. Uh, to the Lord. And I think in order for us to be rightly situated as we dive into these verses, I think that we need to be reminded of a couple of significant, paramount truths. The first being, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Like the scripture testifies of this reality over and over again. It's not something that's ambiguous. In Matthew one twenty three, Jesus is described as God with us. In Isaiah 6, Jesus is mighty God. John 1, 1 through 3 says that Jesus, who is the Word, is God. Jesus claimed to be God in John 5, in John 8, in John 10, in John 14, and in John 20, 28, Thomas says, Jesus is my Lord and my God. Jesus is identified with God the Father in Acts 20, 28. In Philippians 2, 5 through 7, Paul says that Jesus was in the form of God. In Colossians 2.9, in him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In 1 Timothy 3.16, we see God was manifest in the flesh. In Titus 2.13, Jesus is referred to as our great God and Savior. Not exhaustive, but it, not ambiguous. <laughs> not ambiguous at all either. And so don't let, you know, don't let Muslims make you think otherwise if you're in an evangelistic conversation with them. But because Jesus is God, right, which he is, it makes our text more puzzling, doesn't it? it? makes our text maybe a little bit more confusing, at least at first glance. Jesus says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. There's this unbroken 
unity between the Father and the Son. And yet, in our text, there's a place of seeming disunity. But I think this perceived tension is resolved when we remember another significant or a prominent reality, a key reality for us to unlock this text. And that's not only that Jesus is God, which he is, but he's also man. Jesus is truly a human. And that's the second truth we need to be mindful of this evening. John writes in John 1.14, And the Word, remember, who is God from John 1, 1 through 3, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, the eternal word, he became a man. The immortal, eternal one robed himself in flesh. He really was human. And we see that throughout the Gospels. Like consider, you know, just to consider a few things. Jesus was born, wasn't he, in Luke 2, 7. He sleeps in Mark 4, 36 through 41. He's hungry in Matthew 4, 2. He weeps in John eleven thirty five. 35. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in Luke 2, 52. And so Jesus really was a man. And uh, Paul writes about this extensively in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And I want to go ahead and read this because I think this is the key that really unlocks the passage for us tonight so that we understand it rightly. And we don't, I feel like we're walking a thin line as we go through this passage. And if you go off either side, you can uh, become heretical pretty quick. And so you've got to you've got to navigate it rightly. We've got to be very careful to understand what God has and intends uh, to reveal to us through this text. Paul says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, be, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross." So Jesus is God. He is in the very form of God, and yet he laid aside his divine prerogative. He, this takes place through taking upon himself, uh, in part, taking upon himself uh, humanity. So he's God, and he became the form of man, or a real man. I want you to notice the parallel there. Form of God means he was is God. Form of man is a reference to him being really a man. So I hope you can see that parallel here. Like, this is absolutely a passage that says that Jesus is God, but it clearly says as well that Jesus was a real man. And he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, does that mean Jesus ever disobeyed? No, it doesn't. That's not what's being communi communicated here. It's as though if you were to look at, like, um, I don't know, but, but whenever it says that Jesus was becoming obedient or growing in obedience... You know, that was just fulfilling the, the, the fullness of the obedience that would take place within his life on the earth. It's as though, you know, he's just continually being obedient, never disobeying, but that's what the growing in obedience is, is he just continues as a man. And that's just a, a testimony of the reality that he really was a man, he really is a man, uh, which, is, which is great because in order for him to be our representative, right, Jesus had to be a man. Like in the gospel, that's significant. You know, we, were, we, we, we need someone that is a man that can actually die on the cross, but he needs to be God because then he can actually bear wrath in his body, eternal wrath that we deserve. And so he has to be both God and man for the gospel to, uh, to make sense, for the gospel to work. And so he had to be both, but Jesus never disobeyed. So Jesus, he was always in step with the Father and the Spirit, and so he really was a man. And so what I want to do, right, like we're on the precipice of jumping into our text head first. We're just going to dive in. But before we get in there, I want to ask you this, because I think this will also be helpful in framing the discussion for us. How many of you just cannot wait? How many of you are just looking forward so much to the next time that you suffer? For those that are suffering, how many of you are thinking, man, I just love this. I don't ever want it to stop. If he only heaven would be full of suffering. Like you're not out there. And if you're out there and you're saying that, I think there's something wrong. And I'd love to talk with you about that. But we weren't 
designed to delight in suffering at all. That's not what we want. We aren't delighted, designed to want suffering forever. We've been crafted in such a way that when we do suffer, we long for it to be over. Like we see that modeled by Paul, for example, in 2 Corinthians 12 with the thorn in the flesh. Was it wrong for Paul to request three times for the Lord to take it away from him? No, it wasn't inherently sinful, but was it in accord with God's will? It wasn't. We've got to be careful as we navigate through this, but Paul possibly thought the thorn in the flesh, be it, would, if, if he didn't have that, it would cause him to minister better, but the Lord taught him that wasn't the case. God responds in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, followed by Paul's response. We'll read both. And he has said to me, Paul says, and he quotes the Lord, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul then continues, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So God's plan for Paul was that Paul would suffer. And, that it, that it, and you might think, well, why would God do that? Why would God cause Paul to suffer? What, for that matter, why would God cause me to suffer? Why would God cause anyone to suffer? Well, we have to remember that while suffering for those that love the Lord is not an eternal reality, like once we go to be with the Lord, we will never suffer again. All tears are wiped away from our eyes. We are with the Lord. Uh, we will see Him and we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. We read in 1 John 3 with reference to Jesus. And if we're like Him, that means we're not sinning, right? If we're made in the likeness of Jesus, Jesus can't sin. He doesn't sin. We won't be able to either. But in this life, suffering produces godliness. In what way? Well, think about this. When you go through times of suffering, who do you cling to? Who do you pray to? I feel like suffering, in many ways, what it does is it just dismantles this facade that we have where we can become convinced that we can do life on our own and that we don't really need the Lord. And I think suffering in many ways, and that's not the only reason for suffering, but I think in many ways it does bring us back to the Lord and it really reminds us of, of, of our need for Him. So suffering does produce godliness. Suffering causes us to long more for the Lord and also long more for heaven when we won't be suffering from these things anymore, which again, it, it gives us more of an eternal perspective. So that brings us to Luke twenty two forty one. 41. I imagine none of you want to be suffering. Imagine that. I hope I'm right in that. So let's read Luke twenty two forty one. And he withdrew from there out of stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray. So Jesus... He goes away from the rest of his disciples. He knows his betrayals around the corner. I think there are certain things that we need to be very, very careful with when we, read through the, when we read through this text. It's not as though Jesus doesn't know what's about to happen. Remember that. Keep that in mind. To put that in your back pocket. We'll come back to it later. Jesus knows that his betrayals around the corner. Judas has already dipped his morsel, and, and he, Jesus commissioned him to go out. He knows the betrayal is going to be taking place there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus, as God, prays to God the Father. So just a little question as we're diving in. Do you think Jesus believed there was power in prayer? Do you think that Jesus believed prayer was important? Well, I think he did because he's praying, right? And so even for us, in answering our question, do our prayers matter? Is prayer important? Like Jesus is saying, yes, prayer is important. He says it directly in Matthew 6. But So Jesus... He's a man steeped in prayer. He's certainly a model for us. And Jesus, we have to be reminded as well, I think, when we come into this text, he came into this world to do his Father's will, right? In John 4, 34, he says to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so question, does that mean that the Father's will isn't also Jesus' will? No, it doesn't important concept to think through emphasis but not exclusion just because jesus is emphasizing one thing doesn't mean that another thing isn't equally true like you know it won't, just in thinking through that conceptually jesus's will is lined up with the father's will it's lined up with the spirit's will as well because we know that our god is one deuteronomy 6 4 also see things like that iterated in second corinthians 13 14 and first peter 1 2 god is united Jesus says, as we already referenced in um, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. And Jesus knew 
while in this world. He didn't lay aside his divine prerogative. We read about that in Philippians 6 through 7, through becoming a man. He knew he would be dependent upon the Father and Spirit. Now, it's a little tricky because it's equally true that he didn't always um, suspend his divine nature. We see passages where the Father and the Spirit's work isn't necessarily highlighted. Just think about this. Jesus, this very one who has come to do the Father's will, is still God, very God. Like He did not subvert that. He did not. He, he, he is always and will ever be God. And now that He's added a, a human nature to Himself, He is always man. He's fully God, fully man, or truly God, truly man. Uh, I think you can say either or both are right. So, but anyway. Jesus, when he was being sustained in Mary's womb, he was sustaining the galaxies above. Like in this moment, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is sustaining the heartbeats of all of his disciples. Like that is who Jesus is. You cannot remove that from him. If you do, he's not God. So he, he's absolutely the same God. He's absolutely the same one still fulfilling these responsibilities. Something that's very difficult for us to understand. Fully God, fully man. But Jesus here, he, 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 the, he is still one that knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to transpire. And that actually brings the weight of his circumstance to bear in this prayer before his Father. Let's look at verse 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus prays if this cup could be removed from him. You might be thinking, you know, what is this cup? Is this a physical cup? Is this some conceptual cup? What's going on here? Well, Jesus here, he's pulling on the Old Testament, a bunch of threads from the Old Testament. So let me read a few, and we'll see if we can identify what this cup is. In Psalm 75, 8, we read, In the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours it out, he pours out from it all the... All, he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Maybe this cup is punishment for sin, sins that Jesus didn't even commit. Let's keep reading. Jeremiah 25.15 Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. I think we got it there. And make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Isaiah 51, 16 through 18, we read that Jerusalem had drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. And this isn't just exclusively an Old Testament concept. It's also presented in the New Testament as well in the book of Revelation. We read in Revelation 14, 10, that of the wicked, that he uh, will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured out in the full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 16, 19, John says, The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So what is Jesus asking here? What is Jesus praying in this moment with his Father? He is asking the Father for the cup of wrath to be removed from him. And at first that might sound strange, but sort of to pull together what we've talked about already this evening, think about this. Jesus did not long for the suffering that he was about to experience. And can you blame him? I don't think any of us long for pain and wrath. Now, of course, Jesus will endure it. And Jesus knows this as well. We know it from Isaiah 52 and 53 and other places. But he doesn't long for or just earnestly desire this wrath that he is about to suffer under from the Father. Think about this. Hades, hell, and the lake of fire. Think about how they're described in Scripture. I'm going to list some adjectives for your ways they're described. It's a place of weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. I mean, just let these words hit you in their full force this evening. 
It is a place of darkness. Not like, hey, it's dark out at night with a few stars in the sky. It is pitch black, dark, flames. How that works, we'll find, well, like, we won't find out. <laughs> hopefully, you won't find out. Uh, hopefully, you won't find out. You won't if you know the Lord, if you love the Lord. I was going to say, we'll find, uh, yeah, darkness and flames. I, I have no idea. Never want to find out. Burning, torment, everlasting punishment reserved for the wicked. I mean, can you imagine suffering in that place for one hour, let alone all of eternity? And it just is a plea to you, like if you, if you know the Lord, you're not going there. If you believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you love him, and you're seeking to honor him, and you want to make much of him, you're not going there. Your sins are forgiven. They've been removed from you. God has removed wrath from you. It's no longer going to be poured out on you. It was poured out upon Christ. We read Paul right about that in the book of Romans. So that's significant. But if you have not believed, if you have not turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn to him right now in faith. Run to him. Run to him for the forgiveness of your sins, because he lived without sin. He died in the place of those that would run to him. He lives forevermore. He rose from the grave. And if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sins forgiven, eternal life. Run to him today, and you won't suffer in this place. You'll never suffer eternally in the lake of fire. You'll never know what this is like. You'll never find out what darkness and flames are look like together. And granted, just as a qualification there, I'm listing a bunch of adjectives to describe all of these different places. Hades and hell, temporary residences, the lake of fire permanent. There is some overlap there, but there is there are some differences too. And so uh, I was just being a little fast and loose with the descriptors there. But anyways, hell is a serious place. And when you think about the suffering that takes place I mean, really, any of these three places, it's just a, I mean, it is a, it is a scary, scary thing to think about this. And so God, he designed hell as a place where those that reject him with their lives would suffer under his wrath forever. And think about this, the context when Jesus says, remove the cup from me, Jesus would suffer eternal wrath, not just in the period of an hour, like an eternal death which would be an eternity of wrath. He's suffering for that, not just for an hour for one person, but he is suffering under the Father's wrath for, imagine, you could say three hours, six hours, somewhere in there, possibly a little bit longer. But he's suffering the eternal death that was owed by the millions of people that he'd chosen in eternity past to believe in him. Remember those adjectives. He is suffering the eternal death and weight of those adjectives for millions of of people in his body. I think if Jesus didn't say, let this cup pass from me, we would question whether or not he truly was a man, that he's truly human. So is Jesus' request wrong? Is Jesus' request sinful? Of course not. We see throughout we see throughout Scripture that Jesus had no sin. We see that in Hebrews 4.15. We see it in 2 Corinthians 5.21. 1 Peter 2.22 and 1 John 3.5, they all say that. Jesus was sinless. So not only was his request not sinful, his motivation wasn't either. Jesus wasn't sinful, yet he's to suffer under God's undiluted wrath for hours. As Hebrews 12 states, we keep this in mind, verse 2, it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. So that is at play here. But Jesus, we, what we have to realize, he's not, in, in making this request, he's not seeking to back out of the salvation of his people. He's not seeking to say, um, he, he's not seeking for his people to not be saved. That is not the motive of this prayer. That is not the heart behind it. Jesus knows the cross is coming. He knows it's coming, but he doesn't desire the wrath that's about to be placed upon his shoulders. So Jesus prays, let this cup pass from me. In this portion of prayer of Jesus' prayer is not answered. But his prayer doesn't stop there either, does it? The crescendo of his prayer comes at the end of this verse. He says, yet not my will, but yours be done. God tells God, not my will, but yours be done. 
brain might hurt a little bit in thinking about that. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. Difficult for us to understand. Difficult for us to think about. We're looking into a, 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 a intimate Trinitarian conversation taking place. What does Jesus mean here? Are the Father and the Son divided in their will in this moment? Again, Jesus is a man. Yes, he's still God, but here we see the trueness of his humanity. Jesus has not forgotten his mission. Jesus has not forgotten the prophecy from the Old Testament that he's come to fulfill. Has he? Do you think that he has? Think about Luke 4.21. Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he reads from the book of Isaiah and he says, Today this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. And he's referring to himself. Throughout the Gospels, I, I, I've done a count before, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I think it's something like 18 times when you mesh them together that Jesus tells about his death and or his death or resurrection to the disciples. He knew it was coming before it ever came, and he let them know long before it happened. Jesus knew that the cross awaited him. Jesus knew that he would suffer under the Father's wrath. That was his plan too. He just doesn't de desire the physical agony that's about to take place. And I think that's something we can understand. I think we can understand why Jesus is saying that. But oh, how important those final words of this prayer are. The priority of prayer is God's will being accomplished. The purpose of prayer is to honor God, and the motivation of prayer is that his will would be done. We pray God's will be done. And for us, the reason we do that is, you know, we don't always know the ins and outs of how God's will is fleshed out. Like, I think we know what we should pray for and what we can pray for, and we'll talk about some of that a little bit later. But for example, I don't know which of my neighbors are elect, have been chosen in eternity past for salvation, but does that mean I shouldn't pray for them or preach the gospel? It's like, no, I, I do both, but with an understanding the Lord's will be done. If they aren't elect, it's not a sinful prayer. Like, God delights that, that you know, delights in the proclamation of his word. We're commissioned to do it. We're not commissioned to only preach to some people. We're commissioned to preach to all, to the whole world. We're to go out into the whole world and declare these things. You read about that in Acts 1.8. And we, could, we should pray for their salvation. Pray that they come to know the Lord, but always with an understanding that ultimately the Lord's will would be done. But that's not a sinful prayer at all, at all. Because God delights in salvation, and we delight in the things God delights in. But we just pray this with a recognition that God is the one that will will answer this prayer. And the answer will be yes, not now, or no, but he will answer that prayer. So Jesus, the Son of God, tells God the Father, your will be done. And as we know, for those who've read the story, the, the, the Father's will is accomplished. Jesus does drink the wrath of the Father. He drinks that cup. He suffers at the hands of men. He suffers on the cross to pay for sins at the hands of the Father, where the one who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He drank down the dregs of God's wrath for us. Just like, oh, how that fuels worship. Oh, how amazing that thought is that he suffered for us. He suffered darkness and flame and punishment and all of these things that we would have suffered under, you know, effectively. Just the things we would have suffered and deserved to suffer in, in hell forever. He paid for those things that, he for our sins for us, and he rose from the grave three days later. But he 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 does suffer under the cup of the Father. He does suffer under his wrath, and this is like this is the best prayer. And a portion of it is never answered in the affirmative, but we can absolutely understand why it was requested. And when we look at this prayer, if we ask, "Was it answered?" It's like, yeah, it was. The Lord's will was done. Now, some, you know, at this point, some of you might be thinking, Henry, that's a really interesting prayer request to choose, to talk about God's sovereignty in prayer, and to even just talk about the purpose of prayer. And if that's you, I thought that too. Uh, but I think it's just a really, really helpful example. God praying to God. We still see the purpose of prayer. We still see the motivation of prayer on display. And I think this is a, a prayer in particular that a lot of people have trouble with, a lot of people have questions about. Is God divided here? Is God's will truly consistent? And it's like, I think hopefully you can see at this point, yes, it is consistent. It is the will of the Father and the will of the Son. But Jesus didn't want to physically suffer under the wrath he was about to experience, showing that he's truly man. So hopefully you can see that at this point. But I think there's absolutely value in looking into this prayer. And so, so why should we pray? 
Why should we be a people that pray? Well, the purpose of prayer is that we come before God in light of who he is, our great God that we serve, that we make much of him. Jesus is an example of this here. And our worship can be declaring praises of who he is in prayer. It can be uh, through making requests of him. Both are true in this communion with God. And here we see a request is highlighted, but Jesus comes as a worshiper of his Father, he is the father that cares about him, and he makes a request to him. And, and, and that's what we see on display here. And the ultimate motivation of prayer is that God would be honored through his will being done. Now, why, why is that the case? Because God is good and he is in control. And if, just, if you think about it, if there's anyone that you want who's... If there's any... The one that you want... Uh, Man, I'm, I'm struggling, struggling to get this sentence out in my head. I have it, but I'm, I'm tr struggling a little bit here. You want God's will to be done. That's an easier way to say it. If there's anyone whose will you want to be done, it's God's. That's what I was trying to say. It's just a weird way to It's just a little complex there, for me at least. Um, <laughs> but but uh, the reason I say that, we're so short-sighted. You know, we, 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 can't see, we can't see tomorrow. We can't see 10 years from now. We can't see the next second. But God can. God knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. God, God, we are so weak, and yet God is powerful. We're limited by time and space. God is not. When we pray, even if our prayers aren't placarded with the phrase, your will be done, that should be the central heart of every single prayer that you ever request or make to God. We pray that God's will would be done, even as Jesus commissions his disciples to pray in Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And yes, your prayers do matter. Both are equally true. Throughout the Bible, we see these twin truths. God invites prayer and answers it in accordance with his will. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, verses 21 and 22, God answers Elijah's prayer and raises the widow of Zarephath's son back to life from the dead. Same is true in John 11, verses 41 through 44, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Hannah, they all pray for children. The Lord opens their wombs. In James 5, 16 through 18, we see the power of prayer on display. There's power in prayer precisely because we serve an all-powerful God. Billy Graham once said, John Knox prayed, and the results caused the Queen, of Queen Mary to say that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than she feel, feared all the armies of Scotland. John Wesley prayed, and revival came to England, sparing that nation that ho the horrors of the French, French Revolution. Jonathan Edwards prayed, and revival spread throughout the American colonies. History has been changed time after time because of prayer. I tell you, history could be changed again if people went to their knees in believing prayer. Even when times are bleak and the world scorns God, he works through the prayers of his people. Pray today for revival in your nation and around the world. We should pray, be a people of prayer because God is sovereign. Absolutely. I love that quote from Billy Graham. But think, just think about this question. Why would you pray if God isn't sovereign? Like if God cannot control the outcome or has not appointed the ends, why would we pray at all? If God is still learning, then how can we trust him? How can we trust, and this isn't true, like, just, just developing a scenario here, a case scenario, but if that were, the, if, if that were uh, what were taking place, if God's learning, then how can we trust prophecy at the end of Revelation? If, we, if we're not sure that that's going to come to pass, if God is out of control, and then that begs the question, and if he's out of control, then who is in control? Us? Satan? Some other, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not right, it's not biblical, but, but you know, God's sovereignty should fuel, it should inflame our prayer life. We, like, we can trust God and that his will will be accomplished through the prayers of his people because he is sovereign. His will will be done on the earth. And even when we pray, it's a testimony that God is sovereign, that we're dependent upon him and that we recognize he's in control of things that we are not. He's in control of all things. Jerry Bridges once said, Prayer assumes the sovereignty of God. If God isn't sovereign, we have no assurance he's able to answer our prayers. Our prayers would become nothing more than wishes. Think of, like, you know, people throwing coins in a wishing well or something like that. 
But while God's sovereignty, along with his wisdom and love, is the foundation of our trust in him, prayer is the expression of that trust. Another great quote. I just hope you can see that God's sovereignty in no way impugns uh, the, the, the joyous responsibility that we have to pray. Prayer is a privilege. Like, yes, we're told to pray, we're asked to pray, but it's a privilege. Again, what an overwhelming thought that at any time we can pray to the one who fashioned the heavens and the earth, who, 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 who causes the water to flow down Niagara Falls, who's caused Mount Everest to stand as tall as it does, who's placed the stars in the sky. Like this one we can talk to at any time, this God who cares about us and loves us, and God absolutely uh, desires your prayers. He answers your prayers. So you and I, sh we should excel in our knowledge of the Lord, and we should be excelling in our prayer life and desiring that, the, that you know we would honor the Lord more in coming before Him. Our prayers do matter. So, that brings us to the follow-through of our time together tonight. So we've talked a lot about the, the meaning and purpose of prayer, why we pray, motivations, things like that. But now let's talk about what to pray for. What are some biblical prayers? How do we pray in line with God's will? How do we do that? Because remember, the prayer that he hears, according to 1 John 5, 14 and 15, uh, I think, is the prayer you know, that he is in line with his will. And so, I could have developed a list of all of these things, but someone else had already done it for us, and I'd rather not reinvent the wheel. Uh, John Piper has a long list. This is something that be, can be found on DesiringGod.com. I did not make this. He did. And I've excluded a couple that I don't think are normative today, but he says, and I quote, Pray that God would exalt his name in the world. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, Matthew 6, 9. Should have given you a little context here. He will give how to pray and then a verse behind it or two verses. Pray that God would extend his kingdom in the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10 Pray that the gospel would speed ahead and be honored. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as is happening among you. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 Pray for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If then, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Luke eleven thirteen. Pray that God would vindicate His people in their cause. And will not God vindicate His elect who cry to Him day and night? Luke eighteen seven. Pray that God would save unbelievers. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Romans ten one. Pray that God would direct the use of the sword. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. Pray for boldness and proclamation. Pray at all times in the Spirit and also for me that the words be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians 6, 18 through 19. And now look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Acts 4.29 Pray for the healing of wounded comrades. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And pr the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. James 5.14-15 Pray for the healing of unbelievers. It happened that the father of, of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed and put his hands on him and heal him. Healed him. Acts 28, 8. Pray for the casting out of demons. And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Mark 9, 29. Pray for deliverance. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnestly, earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. When he realized he had been freed, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other, other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Acts 12, 5 and 12. After midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Acts 16, 25 and 26. Pray that God would supply his troops with necessities. Give us this day our daily bread. Matthew 6, 11. Pray for strategic wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1, 5. Pray that God would establish leadership in the outposts. 
And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed, Acts 14, 23. Pray that God would send out reinforcements. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, Matthew 9, 38. Pray for the success of other missionaries. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, Romans 15, 30 through 31. Pray for unity and harmony in the ranks. I do not ask for these only, but for those also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so the world that may believe that you sent me, John 17, 20 through 21. Pray for, the, pray for the encouragement of togetherness. We pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your face, faith. 1 Thessalonians 3.10. Pray for a mind of discernment. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and, be, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Philippians 1.9-10. Pray for a knowledge of God's will. And so, from that day we, from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and insight, Colossians 1.9. Pray to know God better. We've not ceased to pray for you, for you to be increasing in the knowledge of God, Colossians 1.10 paired with Ephesians 1.17. Pray for, the, for power to comprehend the love of Christ. I bow my knees before the Father that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to see the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Ephesians 3, 14, 18 through 19. Pray for a deeper sense of assured hope. I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, which what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1, 16 and 18. Pray for strength and endurance. We've not ceased to pray for you to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Colossians 1.11 and Ephesians 3.16. Pray for a deeper sense of God's power within you. I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Ephesians 1.16, 18 through 19. Pray that your faith not be destroyed. I prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Luke twenty two thirty two. Pray for greater faith. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. Mark nine twenty four. Pray that you might not fall into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Matthew six thirteen. Watch and pray that you uh, not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew twenty six forty one. Pray that God would complete your good resolves. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 Pray that you do good works. We've not ceased to pray for you that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. Colossians 1.10 Pray for the forgiveness of your sins. Forgive us of our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Matthew 6, 12. Pray for protection from the evil one. Deliver us from evil. Matthew 6, 13. And I know that's a lot. But I've given, I've given those to you, hopefully as a means of helps to you, just in considering how do I pray according to God's will. Uh, the, the root of it is you pray in accordance with Scripture. And I just wanted to give you a boatload of examples from Scripture of that, of praying in accordance with God's will. There is a whole lot that we can pray for, and we are invited into this conversation where we speak to God, and uh, He you know, speaks to us through His Word. He's telling us what we should be praying for, what we should be asking for, and so we should be a people that follow in tow. And the reason that we pray is because of who our God is. He is the God that is in control. We know our, answer, our prayers will be answered yes, no, or not now. And we should, we should feel liberated knowing that in the end, God's will will be done. Period. End of story. He does whatever he pleases in the heavens and the earth, as Psalm 135 says, and Psalm 115 as well. And we get to take part in that through our prayers to him. 
And just as we bring things to a close, I, I, I wanted to finish with a story. When, when you think about people of prayer, there are probably a number of different names that come to mind, but one of them that jumps to the top of the list for me is George Mueller. Uh, there are a number of different autobiographies that you can read about him. Certainly can do that if you'd like to. Uh, but he, um, he is a man that just had an overwhelming trust in the Lord, particularly modeled through his prayers. And the autobiography, or the, the books that you can get about him, um, are really, actually, I think mainly are just journals. Like, you can get a biography about him, but he actually has notes and prayers that he's written out that you can read about. But there are just so many stories of him trusting in God's purpose and plan and trusting that God truly will provide uh, when, you know, in the bleakest of times, just a man of faith, which is great. Biblical examples of that. I'm choosing to use an extra biblical one right now. Uh, but here we see, uh, I want to show a particular example of this with George Mueller. So George Mueller, he oversaw orphanages in England. He was burdened for the orphans, for the children. He wanted them to uh, be fed physically, uh, but also fed spiritually, that they know God through his word. And he recalls this story in his journal. He writes, one morning, all the plates and cups and bowls on the table were empty. There was no food in, in the larder, nor money to buy food. The children were seated, standing, waiting for their morning mule, meal when Mueller said, Children, you know we must be in time for school. Then lifting up his hands, he prayed, Dear Father, I thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. It was a knock on the door. The baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast and that the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread and have brought it. <laughs> Mr. Mueller thanked the baker. And no sooner than he, when he left, there was a second knock on the door. It was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage, and he would love to give the children cans of fresh milk so that he could empty the wagon and repair it. <laughs> That's the end of the story, but I love it. Why do I share that with you? Because God cares about his people. God cares about you. God delights in answering your prayers. And we should be a people of prayer. God answers prayers in expected and unexpected ways, but it's always according to his will. So we should be a people uh, that trust in God, knowing that it will accomplish his word, uh, knowing that his will will be done, even through our prayers. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer to uh, appropriately thank him for our time together speaking about prayer. Father, we praise you for this medium of communication that we have with you because we don't deserve it. Lord, what a privilege we have that we can come before your throne at any moment to, to, to pray, to, to bring our requests to you, to make much of you, the good God that we serve. Lord, I pray that this time would be helpful for those that are listening, that uh, you would stimulate their prayer life, that it would have more, uh, uh, yeah, that it would have more life. That, it would, uh, that, that they would be more of an understanding of why we pray, the purpose of prayer, the motivation that we have in prayer, and ultimately that we would seek always and ever more in prayer to have uh, you be honored and your will be done in and through it. Father, we praise you for this time we've gotten to spend together tonight, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, thank you for joining uh, uh, us for the study this evening. I uh, certainly wish I could see you. I did want to say, just before you leave, and you may have already left, and so you'll miss this if you have, but um, I included a link in the description below the video. It is a link to a song that I would have loved for us to sing together if we were all together. It is a song by a group called City Alight, and it's called Your Will Be Done. And I would encourage you, before you shut everything down for the night, just to listen to that song. It has the lyrics on the screen. You might, if you're with your family, you might want to sing it out loud. If you're by yourself, you might want to sing it out loud. But I can't think of a more appropriate way to end our time together tonight than by listening to that song. And so I'd encourage you to that end. Again, City of Light, your will be done. There should be a link below this video in the description. And so, but all that being said, God bless you. Have a wonderful night full of Christ.